this time, it is my pleasure and privilege to introduce our keynote commencement speaker, the Honorable Mark Ridley Thomas, who is a remarkable public servant. He is the longest serving member of the current Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors, serving more than two million LA residents in the second district, which is also home to USC. He has been an advocate for local communities. Supervisor Ridley Thomas' political career was preceded by a service as the executive director of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference of Greater Los Angeles, an organization with roots that trace back to the Montgomery bus boycott. Since 1986, he has authored 142 op-ed pieces on a wide range of subjects, including gun violence, law enforcement justice, economic development, child welfare, housing, homelessness, and employment development. And he is widely regarded as the foremost advocate for neighborhood participation in government decision making, founding the Empowerment Congress, arguably the region's most successful initiative for neighborhood-based civic engagement. And I'm proud to say for the last eight years, the annual Empowerment Congress has been hosted right here on the USC campus. But that shouldn't come as a surprise because Mark Ridley Thomas is a loyal Trojan. He received his PhD from USC in social ethics, focusing on social criticism and social change. His passionate and progressive interest in bettering the worst social and economic problems for under-resourced and marginalized Angelinos has been a hallmark of his political career and has led him to develop a national model of civic engagement built on the principles of participatory democracy, reciprocal accountability, and intentional civility. His work with communities led him to a career in public office and in 1991, he was elected to the Los Angeles City Council, where he served for 12 years, also leaving as council president. He went on to serve two terms in the California State Assembly, where his legislative work addressed a broad range of issues, including health care, public safety, education, budget accountability, consumer protection, and civic participation. He also served in the California State Senate, where he chaired the Senate's Committee on Business professions and economic development in the California Legislative Black Caucus. Last year, USC awarded him an honorary doctoral degree, the highest award it confers, in recognition of his outstanding professional achievements and his contributions to the welfare and development of our community. Mark Ridley Thomas is a leader who brings a vision of change and progress, born of his education and his continued interest and applying new and innovative ideas to the advancement of social good. So I am most proud to say that he serves on the Price School's Board of Counselors and proud to have him here today to speak to the next generation of leaders. Please give a warm round of applause and welcome Honorable Mark Ridley Thomas. Well, thank you very much, Dean Knott, for that generous uh, introduction, for your invitation to uh, deliver this year's commencement address and for your leadership here at the Saul Price School of Public Policy. Why don't you give your dean a big round of applause? Thank you. To the faculty, staff, and especially the graduates of the class of 2018, I consider it an honor to be with you here today. And as graduates um, of the Price School, uh, whose mission is to improve the quality of life for people and their communities, I wish to assert this morning that policy matters. And if you accept this thesis, uh, that policy matters, I invite you to explore for a short uh, while uh, the following question. What is your policy memorandum? Stated differently, uh, what is your policy memorandum and what principles drive your goals and your objectives as you move forward from here? Now I hasten to inform your answer by reminding you of the fact that you have been successful in completing this stage of your educational uh, journey in a competitive and hopefully fulfilling 
uh, academic environment. Uh, you have studied in a policy ecosystem and governance context that by the usual standards of measurement is the most diverse and endowed in the world. We call it Los Angeles. We call it Los Angeles. Consider uh, the following, if you will. This is a jurisdiction or region of more than 10 million residents, the largest in the nation. The average life expectancy is 82 years, and the median age is 35 years. Uh, the gender split is 50.7% female and 49.3% male. All right, fellows, they did it to us again. We might as well recognize it. 50.7% uh, female and 49.3% male. Right here. And if you permit me a point of personal privilege, uh, I want to pause and acknowledge uh, someone who's been edging me out for 38 years of marriage, my wife, Avis Ridley Thomas. She's in the house today. According to the Franchise Tax Board, as we seek to understand Los Angeles, uh, has some 16,507 millionaires who reside herein more than anywhere in the nation. And at the same time, the Los Angeles Housing, uh, the Los Angeles Homeless Service Authority uh, tells us that the largest homeless population in the nation is shamefully found right here totaling nearly 60,000 people every single evening. Los Angeles has the second largest bioscience industry sector in the state of California, and this is important because when the Great Recession took uh, place, everything was falling down and bioscience went up, uh, and now we uh, boast of being number two in that environment with of $40 billion in economic activity and over 70 uh, million, uh, I'm sorry, 70,000 in direct jobs. Uh, the largest regional uh, economy uh, focusing on the arts and entertainment in the nation, standing at some $190 million in economic activity and 750,000 uh, people employed in the creative economy right here in Los Angeles. And let me just simply say to you, according to U.S. News and World Report, Los Angeles is the home of the second-ranked public affairs and policy school anywhere in the United States, and that would be the Saul Price School of Public Policy, and you ought to be mighty, mighty proud of that fact. Uh, the late Kevin Starr, a friend and colleague, a historian, and made his mark here in USC and elsewhere, said this about Los Angeles. Uh, it invented itself as a totality. And while New York brought itself into being from previously existing parts, uh, ask a New Yorker where he or she is from, and he will uh, tell you, he or she will tell you the precise neighborhood, the precise borough ask an Angelino the same question, and he or she will say, I'm from Los Angeles. And so the point to be made here is that Los Angeles is uh, unique in a lot of ways, and for these reasons and more, this place, this space, uh, this context, at uh, this unique moment in time is the quintessential policy laboratory, and you have had a tremendous opportunity afforded to you. Uh, let me just highlight one example that I can uh, give you. Uh, one of your fellow graduates, uh, Chris Arsan. Uh, Chris, Chris is in the house today. Uh, Chris uh, worked in my office um, as a Bonnet Leadership Fellow uh, from January 2017 and provided a great deal of support and assistance during my tenure as chair of the board. 
And then uh, this fellowship, as you know, is provided by USC trustee David C. Bonnet. And then Chris had the opportunity to work on a, a range of initiatives, including public safety, justice, the arts, and he played a key role in gathering data and analyzing demographics covering the quarter of a century of evolution in Los Angeles uh, since the nation's most traumatic and costly uh, civil unrest in 1992. And I just have to say this month, uh, Chris will assume a full-time position in my office as an assistant deputy. So I want to say that Chris got game, he got him a job, he'll be employed, and we congratulate him for that. And I know there are systems innovators and difference makers and change agents among uh, you in the audience today, and I want you to know that I see you. It was 30 years ago, nearly 30 years ago, when I uh, sat in a similar chair, having completed my doctoral work here in the field of social ethics. Uh, my academic focus was social criticism and social change. Uh, this area of study was heavily influenced as a field of uh, study uh, by moral philosophy, and social ethics was launched in the 19th century to advance the ethical dimensions of social science and, by extension, public policy. And as ethicists, we speak the language of norms, of warrants, of values, of claims, of rights, and, of course, the common good. We are not strangers uh, to public policy and social systems. We seek to understand and analyze and, more importantly, prescribe what ought to be done in the face of such policies and systems. In the kindred discipline of theology, the systematic theologian asks the question, what am I to believe or think? The social ethicist, on the other hand, asks the question, what am I to do? In other words, we make the distinction between orthodoxy and agency. This is in part why the body of my work over the past three decades has been focused on analysis and solutions. But more fundamentally, my sense of servant leadership has been about the critique of the status quo and advocating for systemic social change. In the public sector, uh, where governance is central, uh, this is called reform. And I'm here to tell you this morning that it is not for the faint of heart. Let me give you three brief examples that have consumed a, a significant amount of my time and patience and imagination, and they are as follows. The first of which is a uh, area in law enforcement. As a proponent of accountable law enforcement and constitutional policing, uh, the work to clean up and uh, reform, first LAPD and now the Sheriff's Department, has been both complicated and arduous. And part of this is true because law enforcement is viewed as what? Uh, the sacred cow of government. And yes, we should honor peace officers as society definitely needs them, but all communities need them to do their jobs properly. Just believe me, when they, do the, when they don't do their jobs well, it costs us both monetarily and morally. And so those of you who seek leadership positions in law enforcement, I ask you today, what is the policy memorandum that you hope to write, that you hope to implement, that you hope to live? The second area of reform I want to direct your attention to is one of the areas in which I had to learn as a member of the Board of Supervisors, that's the area of child welfare. Los Angeles has nearly 30 thousand children, youth, and related individuals who are involved in the Department of Children and Family Services, the largest number of dependents in any jurisdiction in the nation. Uh, these are they, these children, who can hardly fend for themselves and have been subjected to all sorts of unspeakable abuses. Reform efforts facilitated through the work of the Blue Ribbon Commission on Child Protection led to the Office of Child Protection. And I want to tell you that I want to ask that office not to be absorbed by the bureaucracy, but to uh, retain a critical consciousness and pose some questions 
that are worthy of our collective consideration. What assumptions does a massive bureaucracy make about these children? How are these children's guide, children guided into meaningful lives? What is the role of a policymaker, a public administration, or even a public official in maximizing good outcomes for these children and their families? And I ask you today, uh, what are the appropriate risks taken in support of those who are least capable of protecting themselves? What is the policy memorandum of your life's work as you seek to confront the systems that perpetuate or ignore the commercial sexual exploitation of underage victims and survivors right here in Los Angeles County? The third area of reform is juvenile justice. And I want to say that there are 9,000 youth in custody, either in juvenile hall or in probation camps. And we know uh, many of the problems that they contend with, but there are many of the issues in the Department of Pro Probation that we know not of. But finally, after a 10-year push, ladies and gentlemen, we will have more public scrutiny on the problems by independent experts and advocates comprising a reform and implementation team. We will now come to see who will step forward and work for the common good of these young people, who will work to benefit them in terms of rehabilitation rather than paramilitary tactics that only lead to higher rates of recidivism. What is the shape, I ask you today, what is the shape of your policy memorandum as you advocate for juvenile justice reform? In each of these instances, these three examples of reform afoot in the region that we call Los Angeles, uh, there's a national backdrop and conversation that affects what is going on in our respective communities. And while I can hardly resist discussing the national scene uh, today, I'll settle for a quote from the nation's premier drum major for justice and child advocate, uh, the one and only Marion Wright Edelman. And she says it this way, you just need to be a flea against injustice. And enough committed fleas biting strategically can make even the biggest dog uncomfortable and transform the wealthiest nation. And I think Marion Wright Ullman is right. We need to put some fleas in our public policy uh, memorandum and make those who perpetuate injustice uncomfortable. And while we do that, some of you may feel this morning's discourse is a bit too idealistic uh, for the world's of public sector finance or local government administration. Others of you may think demystifying the bureaucracy and creating change is a fruitless endeavor and a steady income stream and means of securing retirement are what matters the most. And I simply offer you another option, one that reconciles the practical and the aspirational. Over the years, uh, many have referred to this as the locus of pragmatism and idealism. It is the domain of the pragmatic idealist. Local civil rights e uh, icon John W. Mark Mack lives by this creed, hold on to your core principles and just get the job done for the social good. In the legislative process, it is often described as uh, the perfect is the enemy of the good. And tech and media wizard Bernard Leon says it this way, believe in your dreams, and the only thing that stands between dreams and reality is your own hands to make it happen. And so in working out your own policy memorandum, fail not to consult uh, the pragmatic idealist who will tell you if there's a problem, you can solve it. If there's an obstacle, you can scale it. If there is a challenge, you can overcome it. If there is a deficit, you can close it. If there is an impasse, you can bridge it. And if there's blight, you can revitalize it. If there is a strife, you can mediate it. And if there is homelessness, you can organize your moral capacity and work to end it. If there is a battle, you can win it. And so I bid you glad tidings today and well wishes on this special occasion. And I urge you in the grand tradition of your alma mater 
to fight on.